Okay, so uh, yeah, once again, uh, good afternoon here at Froscon 12. Uh, nice to have you all here. Uh, the next lecture is from uh, Klaus Elek about uh, Basil, the um, uh, CI and build tool from Google, which they made uh, open source uh, some years ago, I guess. Um, um, I'm really looking forward for this talk. Um, and just a small reminder, uh, please everyone of you, uh, watch the lectures here, uh, please provide us some feedback. It's quite easy, just uh, go to program frosk on the E, uh, choose the lectures you visited and give it a rating. It's something like Amazon rating with a, uh, you can provide some comments and a one to five star rating, which really helps us to, uh, uh, to improve the quality um, of the whole conference. So uh, yeah, please uh, uh, give us some feedback. That would be very nice. So said uh, after uh, having said this, uh, so um, yeah, I guess we should just start. So please uh, give some uh, some hands uh, for Klaus. Okay. So thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to in introduce Basil at Froscon. So first question is, what is Basil? As already mentioned, it is a build tool. That is, it organizes how you compile or create other artifacts, libraries, executables from source. It is open source since 2015, so appropriate for the conference. Uh, but it has a quite long history as a Google internal tool with all the implications that has. But in particular, it means we know the tool works. The more interesting question is, why do we want yet another build tool? So the historic motivation why Google started uh, what is now known as Basil in the first place was to have a tool that scales well. Uh, Google has the approach to have one big repository with at least the majority of all code that is developed at Google, and everyone works at that repository from head. And so you get a quite big code base with all your dependencies in it, and conceptually you want to compile everything from source. So that is the scenario with which Basil is dealing at historic, well, is still dealing at today. So the design is really about aggressively doing things in parallel, be quite aggressive with caching of build operations, but be sure that we still keep correct in the sense that we get the artifacts as if we would use no cache at all and build completely fresh from source right now. And by the same artifacts, I mean byte by byte identical output. So that's um, where the slow and fast correct that is associated with Basil comes from. But I think even if you have a smaller code base, Basil can be quite interesting. So one of the aspects I quite like about Basil is the declarative style of build files, which had the advantage that you separate the concern of writing code, I want to write some library in C, and here's my C code, from the concern of what is the best way to compile that, to cross-compile that to a different architecture, and so on. And yeah, so that declarative style gives you a central maintenance point for your build rules. You only need to specify at one point how you build it, and not update everything if you find there's a better way to compile code of some language. And by now it's a generic tool that is you can provide your own rules in a declarative style how to build things. And I will go through an example towards the end of the talk. Okay, so what is the look and feel of Basil? Let's do that with a simple Hello World example written in C. So here we have a main program, simple program, and it uses a library. So you also provide a library, which usually consists of some header files and some implementation, so some more C files. So in that simple scenario, how would you just instruct Basil to build these things? So well, the first thing is you provide a workspace file, which is literally an empty file. The, the idea of a workspace file is saying, on the one hand, specify where the, the scope of the source tree ends. So I'll pass a relative to the directory where the workspace file lives. And the other purpose of the workspace file is define external repositories or external sources which you might want to include in your build. In that simple example, that is literally an empty file. And then you would write build files, which in that example 
look as follows. So you have a library, C library, say, okay, I have a C library, it has a name, so that is the, so that C library file is the, the lower build file, the one parallel to the, well, to the, to the library files and headers. You give it a name and you specify what are your source files and what are your header files. In that simple case, you can just use clubs. And then you have the executable. So you say there's a CC binary. It has a name. It has a source file. And it has a dependency on a library. And you specify the, well, it's called label of that library. So you have the, the past to the location of the build file, and then a colon, and then the name of the rule in that build file. So you say that C binary depends on that library. Okay, so that's the general look and feel, declarative style, these are my sources, and that is the language they're written in. And it's quite worth noting what is not here, so all the things about which architecture I'm compiling for, do I have to care about cross-compiles, which C compiler, and so on. It's nothing you have to specify each time you, you write a library or binary, so focus on the code. And that is specified at other places, once for the whole project. Okay, so now how do you build your, li your library and your binary from that description? So the general way Bazel builds is that you first load the build file, well, first the one that you specify from your target, but then also all the ones recursively needed uh, as dependencies. You analyze the dependencies between the targets, and then you look at the rules, and from that rules you create a plan what to do, so a graph of actions and you execute them unless you have done so already and have, for example, have in your local cache an entry saying, yes, for these inputs I already ran that action, that's the output. On subsequent builds, you update, just update the graph of your build dependencies that you keep in memory. So Bazel uses a client-server architecture on the local machine. So when you start Bazel the first time in a workspace, it starts to serve in the background and then communicates to that server all the requests, which has the advantage that you keep the constructed graph in memory and only update by watching the underlying file system. And as I said, the, the main use case is that you have all your dependencies from source in the same repository, so that graph can be quite large and therefore it's worth not recomputing it every time you want to build something. Okay, so say we want to build this Hello World binary. The first thing is, okay, it is, you look at the target Hello World, you find it's in the top level directory, so you look at the top level build file. Yeah, so look at the conceptual, at the package where that thing is. So all, all um, directories below a build file except those subdirectories that have a separate build file, that is what Basil calls a package, a unit of sources described by a common build file. And then you read the rule and you find that, well, there are two dependencies, the source file and a library. And actually, again, there's an implicit dependency on the tool chain, so if you change the specification of which tools you want to use, you notice that this target is outdated and you have to rebuild it again, but didn't draw it in the diagram. So again, with the same process, you don't do any recursive calling, you just look at the next package mentioned, which is the lib subdirectory, and you look at the build file there. There you find as dependencies two globs, so you look at the content of the directory, find the corresponding matching files, now you discovered all the things you need for your build, and then you construct the action graph. So from that library, lib colon hello, you get the lower actions, how to compile, uh, well, to, comp to build the library. So these 
uh, one compilation and one linking to a library action, and from the top, colon hello world target, uh, this C binary rule, you get another action to compile the source file and then link with that library to get an executable. So this is the actual actions where you have to read the source files and invoke a compiler, but the tracking of the whole graph with all these logical uh, concepts is what keeps your build correct, and the easiest way to see that is if you add a file, a ah, new file into that library. So none of the actions is directly affected, but you notice that the directory has changed, so you invalidate everything that depends on the directory, so in particular the clubs, and that forces you to re-evaluate the library rule, and once you do that, you see, oh, now I need to generate an additional action, and then you call all that actions and build the final output. Okay, as mentioned, the main part of the actual work are what we call actions. So invocations of a compiler, of a linker, whatever. So they take the most resources for the build, definitely the most time, CPU time, etc. So it is particularly interesting to avoid unnecessary actions. Okay, I mentioned we have the dependency graph which means if nothing has changed, we don't have to redo the action. And in particular, we track all the inputs, so we are sure we're not losing anything. Yeah, so we can, since we track all the inputs and not characteristic timestamp or anything, we can actually cache actions by content of the file. And that at every level. So the first thing you get for free is if you just change a comment, then you do the one compilation step, you find the object file hasn't changed, and re can skip the rest. But for that to work, it's important that you know that you have tracked all the inputs and outputs. Because if you miss something, then, well, that assumption that you have the graph correct uh, doesn't work. So yeah, only, you can only read the inputs that you declared as input for a rule, and none of these timestamp approaches. Uh, fortunately, Bazel has a way to help you doing that correctly. You can ask the actions to be run in what we call sandboxes. These are not a security feature, but they still provide some form of insulated environment where you only have the declared inputs and where you only copy out the declared outputs. So depending on the operating system and the amount of effort you want to work, that can be more or less sophisticated. You can say no sandbox at all, just run everything standalone, which then doesn't help a lot. What all is simple but already helps quite a lot is that you create a temporary directory, copy in, or actually symlink in only the files that you declared as input for that rule, and then copy out the declared outputs. That simple approach catches most of, basically catches all of the errors of not specifying a dependency. And you can go further, and Bazel has that implemented, you can build a change route and yeah, go crazy. So the change route is definitely implemented and then you're sure you're not, you declared all the inputs you need. But that tracking of all the inputs has another advantage. Because now you know which files are actually needed, so you don't have to compile on your local machine. You can also do the compilation step remotely at a different machine. So like your nearby data center if you have one. And that enables yet another quite beneficial operation. So if you execute remotely, then you can use the same compute center as your colleagues and so on, and then you can have a shared action cache. And remember I said that the main use case, or the, the main internal use case is a lot of engineers working on the same code base. So quite likely, someone will have compiled the same sources that you have in your work deal already. And that way you just get a cache hit, you get the answer back immediately and can continue. Okay, so much uh, for the execution model. And we've seen Bazel, we've seen some of the built-in rules of Bazel 
in particular specialized ones for the language that are the more important ones, at least the more important ones to the authors of Bazel, so in particular C, Java, and a couple of other languages. There is also a generic rule, or there are generic rules. One of the, or including one rule called gen rule, where you just specify a command to be executed, and you have some shell-like variables that get expanded in the way you would expect. I'm mentioning that rule because that is basically the only rule you have when you use a traditional make file. And you've seen that you can compose everything from that rule. Uh, but still, adding specialized knowledge for every language is something that won't scale. Definitely not if you want to use it in the open source world where there are hundreds of languages and you can't get specialized knowledge of each and every language into the build tool. So you need a way to extend the language. And therefore, Bazel has a domain-specific language called Skylark in which you can describe your own build rules. The language has a, well, uses Python syntax. So the syntax shouldn't be too scary, shortly known. But it is not full Python anymore. It is restricted to a simple subset of Python. In particular, don't allow any reference to global state so that you can evaluate your build files locally without side effects and in a deterministic, reproducible way. Okay, and to give you a feeling of how Bazel can be extended and how that looks like, it's do a simple example of something that is not a mainstream programming language. Say we want to develop rules to, uh, for LaTeX. Said not mainstream, but still too incomplete, but for the purpose of this talk, it's enough to know that LaTeX generates PDF files, like the slides I'm using from textual description, tech, tech files, and these tech files can refer other files, images, diagrams, but also input other tech files. And there's a sequence of commands you might want to execute in order to build it. But this talk is about the build system and not tech. Okay, so the first approach I took when I was faced with that problem is saying, okay, first of all, what should a LaTeX rule look like? Well, probably you want an entry point, which is the, what is the main document and a bunch of other files that you have. And then you have a script to type, that, uh, type this. So first of all, call PDF LaTeX the correct number of times. Um, take care of all the timestamps that are implicit in such a process, especially if you implicitly convert PostScript files into PDF, then for each of them you get another timestamp, and as I mentioned, you want um, reproducible builds. Also, um, copy all the input into a temporary directory to not rely on sandboxing to avoid polluting the internal workspace. Oh yeah, I should mention that Sounds, uh, I described it with building and so on, but as every sane build system basically generates, as, executes the commands and write the output in a file that is outside the source tree. So it can work with read-only source tree, which should by now be standard for a proper build system. Okay, so you have your script and uh, the interface, and then the first approach is what we call a macro. So you say yes, I can build LaTeX and I express it in terms of rules that are already present in the system. So more simple case, we just have a general. So the syntax is as you would expect for a Python-like language. You say def and then the name. You provide name parameters and give some default values, which probably is only useful for the additional sources because it can have a single file document. And then you just compose your generals with a typical Python command. So you compute a name for the rule, you specify the sources, um, and you pull the string that is the command you want to run, declare the outputs, and you also declare the implicit dependency on the tool. So you just, yeah, whenever you invoke the tool, you have a dependency that is tracked by Bazel on your, well, tool in this case is our script that does the correct invocations. 
But it means that if we change that, then we know all our latest documents are outed and have to be typeset again. Okay, now you have your specific written your macro that just maps everything to a gen rule, then you can load that new thing in a build file. You write a load statement, just the file name relative to the workspace, and you say from that file I want to get into my build file one command, the, you specify it, in this case LaTeX, and then you can use the rule in the same declarative style that you've seen for other rules, just name, main, sources. And that works quite well. Uh, you haven't spent a lot of effort now, but you haven't, um, yeah. And you still gained a bit. You have your central point where you can say, yeah, I'm, maybe later I want to change the rule. I have one place where I have to do it and don't need to go through all the invocations. You can also add, since a macro, you can expand to more than one rule saying, oh, give me a gen rule and then also add a rule that uh, just an, an executable rule that runs the presentation and also um, always build kind of a summary with many pages on a, on a single page and so on. Um, yeah. The next thing you notice is that we, in the particular example of LaTeX that you start syncing into groups of files. You have that slide and it contains five diagrams so it is basically a set of files that you want to declare. And for that, Bazel had something built in which is called a file group. It's a named set of files that may be source files that also may be generated files, which in this case you get a dependency on the underlying target. Yeah, named set of files. So you maintain that set at one point and wherever it's used, the dependencies get tracked correctly and you can add a file group into another file group that is if, if you would add the elements. Removing duplicates and implement in a slightly more memory efficient way. Now that is quite useful concept when you think in groups of sources belonging together. Yeah, and then at some point you come to the point where you find out that macros are quite well and working, but there are some things missing. The first is your missing type checking, in the sense that you have to remember that the main f f um, argument is a single file, and that the source is a list, and if you do that wrong, you get quite confusing error messages. And the other thing you will notice eventually is that there is a limit of how long a command can be. So the limit on ArcV is not terribly small on Linux, but it, you can hit it. So you change your script to say, okay, instead of providing all the arguments, I provide you with one file which contains all the parameters you need to know, in particular all the source files. And you change your macro to a rule. Note, I'm still, the only thing I have to change is that one file which contains the specification of what I want to build. Okay, and then you say LaTeX equals rule, that makes that name a rule, and you specify the attributes of that rule together with the expected type. So I expect main to be a single label, and I expect sources to be a list of labels, and I also declare that implicit parameter on the build tool. You specify the outputs, and you specify an impl implementation of that rule, which is a bit more, so you first compute all the files you need, and then you have something called a file action, which tells Basil, yes, I need to write a file, or generate a file, with a given content that only depends on the build specification, not on the contents of the source files. Typically meant for parameter files, because the same problem of, not, uh, of exceeding the limit of a command line is something you hit with C and Java and so on compilations also if your um, source tree gets big enough and therefore all the main compilers also allow parameter files. So that is a typical use case for a file action. Then you, and then you compute the command line as you would want it as a list of strings. 
okay, once you computed the arguments, you can say, and there is an action where you specify inputs and outputs as a list of files, and you specify a command as a list of strings that that can be called by exec. And you have additional bonus, you can specify uh, a progress message so that in the interface you see what is actually happening. Oh, it's LaTeX invocation, not our executing general, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, additional benefits is that you now have to, can specify a list of arguments instead of a string that is then interpreted by a shell and you have to be a bit careful with quoting and you have a bit of meaningful progress message. That is additional advantages on top of the already mentioned things that you get checking whether you have all needed parameters provided and uh, they are of the correct type and you can now get these two actions depending on each other uh, to avoid the limitations of your command line length. Works nicely, but there's an additional thing that is typical for builds. Okay, so back to the LaTeX example, you start collecting macros, at least I do that. These are my notations for mathematical things and these are all the fancy things I want to use in slides and you organize that all in file groups and then you would say, just input that file group. Well, what do you do? Well, the first thing seems easy. The content of, I, imp, I want to input just one file, one statement, and then the content should be all the files in that file group. Well, that only depends on the names, not on the contents of that file. So you can easily specify your f um, file action, writing out uh, the statements you need, except now you have a problem. Um, whenever you use that generated file, you implicitly also depend on these other files that went into that specification. And you want Bazel to track that dependency. Um, a similar problem we've implicitly seen already earlier in the talk, when I depend on a library, on a C library. I not only depend on the generated library file, I implicitly also depend on the header files when I want to use that library. So there needs to be some way where one rule can pass on a rule that depends on it additional information. And that is what Bazel calls providers. So you state LaTeX info is provider. That makes that name available. And what I didn't tell you so far is that a rule can have a return value, which is then a list of providers. So provider is basically a named, named dict, dictionary. So once you have that, then the consuming rules We've seen so far you compute the inputs and then you compose your actions, can go through the sources and ask if a provider of that name is available in that file, and if so, then access the fields of that provider. Okay, so these are, with that example, I hope I've, well, I've shown the, the main concept that you can use in your extension language there. These are the main concepts, there are more specialized and ready-made um, functions already, but um, yeah, we've seen that you can extend it, you can also start, and what I hope I made clear is you can start simply start with a simple macro that expands just to what you, to your one-line command, and then later you can refine the specification and add additional cooperation with other rules without changing the already existing uh, calls to that rule. Okay, so to sum up, I've shown that um, oh, what is particular about Bazel. Uh, first, you have declarative build files, but you're still a generic tool. That is, you can you bring your own build rules in a Python-like extension language. And in the execution model, Bazel tracks all the dependencies which allow which guarantees correctness of the result, because we know when the output is outdated. We have sandboxing that helps us to make sure we declare all the inputs and outputs correct, correctly, and that full knowledge of the build graph allows um, 
also for speed because we can more aggressively cache based on content. We can execute remotely because we know which files we have to send there. We can do more things in parallel and this remote execution also allows shared caching saying, oh, the colleague already compiled it, I can use the result. And Bazel is open source, so you can try Bazel yourself. These are the contact information here. We have a homepage, we have mailing lists, there is the repository is mirrored on GitHub and there's an issue tracker. There's a not very active IRC channel. So mailing list is probably the better way to contact. And uh, yeah, release artifacts are signed with that key. Um, yeah, that's an overview of Basil and I'm now open for questions. Okay, so the question was who is currently working at Basel and what's their affiliation? So from Google there are, I would say roughly about 30 people working on Basel. Not all of them full time, some also on, I mean, as I said, it's, it's open source and it's also used internally. There are some internal extensions that talk to the internal caching and the internal source control system, so there's some components which are not open source because they don't make sense in the open source. But if you also take that as the broader scope of Bazel, then it's, it's about 30 people working internally at Bazel and externally we, we regularly get contributions from a fairly small number of persons. But it is still the case that the vast majority of commits are from people with that Google Chrome address. question was if you have traditional C project using outer tools, then at configure stage you can say which, for example, which SSL library you want to use and how that works as Bazel. Uh, the answer is unfortunately um, to some extent but not very well. Um, um, because the tradition is that you have your big monolithic repository where have all your dependencies and there is some approach to that because I mentioned the workspace file. There you can specify external repositories and give them a name. Um, that also includes, even though it's still not a very stable interface, saying, okay, there's a pre compiled library, that's the binary, these are the header files. Um, and there you, by changing your workspace accordingly, you can switch to one or the other external dependency. There is no such thing as the outer tools yet for Bazel. But um, there are plans and discussion of about how to best add such a thing to Basel, but that is still a work in progress, unfortunately. Any other question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Basel is basically a server application, or is that because uh, I didn't quite understand? Before, okay, so the the question about whether Basel is a server application, well. Um, it, yes and no. So it's it, technically it's a server client architecture, but that all runs on your local machine. So you basically start a daemon that for each workspace that keep the dependency graph in memory. So when you start build the first time, you add a process in the background, just that you have a persistent process to keep the dependency graph in memory for some time. Because the typical thing is you work on that code bit and you test something work again and you don't want to recompute that graph again. So in that sense, it's a client-server architecture, but it's meant to run on, perf runs perfectly on a single machine and just communicates over the loopback device nowadays um, to keep some process, uh, to keep information persistent in memory. It is also 
client server in the sense that it supports remote execution as an optional feature so that then the, well, what is the base server? The one that organizes the build and is in memory over multiple invocations in the same workspace is then a client to a remote execution or remote cache. Uh, project, but that's all optional. You can have your single single machine and run it, and if you don't really notice, or it's not disturbing that you then start two processes instead of one. And I'll, I mean, you start a lot of processes in the background anyway for your compiler invocations. But just one process then survives at the end to keep the graph in memory in case you need it quickly again. Any other questions? Uh, will the Android maybe be um, providing any build files uh, for Bazel then? The question was whether Android will be providing any build files for Bazel. Uh, I'm not a representative of the Android team, but um, there are definitely rules for Android applications already provided with standard Bazel. So there, is, there definitely are plans, but I'm not sure about timelines or anything that you have to ask the Android uh, project. Is on uh, the progress for end users right? Hmm? Sorry? Oh, the question was whether Bazel is used in the end user devices. So in case of Android, I wouldn't run it on a mobile device. No, um, Bazel supports building Android applications. That is then, yeah. that the applications are then to be run on, on your Android device, but you build it uh, typically on, no, 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 on a different know. machine. I didn't mean just Android device, because end user device, you can mean like desktop. Um, the, so I'm not sure whether I understand the question. The question was whether Bazel is on the end user device. I mean, it depends. If you're a developer, yes, Bazel is open source. You can use it on your desktop, whatever. Uh, but the application you build is a normal C file, normal whatever file. You don't need a Bazel to run the, the program that you compiled in the same way as you don't need Make to run a program that you built with Make. So it's, it's, in that sense, it's a normal build tool as every other build tool. You, use it on whatever machine you want to build something and then the artifact is independent of the tool you use to create it. Yeah? Okay, so the question was about integration into an IDE. There are, there exist some integrations for, for some IDEs. Let me guess that correctly. So it definitely exists for IntelliJ and I think Eclipse. Even so, I'm personally using neither of them, but they, they are integrations. And as far as I can tell from my colleagues, they're quite happy with them. There is also um, a generic mechanism where Bazel can report, uh, so you can invoke Bazel from whatever means. And there's also a machine readable report about what happened uh, during the build. So a sequence of protos that are serialized in whatever format you like. So you can also add your own um, wraparound Bazel that then has a information about what happened during the build in machine readable form. But there, are, there exist IDE integrations, at least for some IDEs. Okay, the question was about caching. Um, okay, there are several levels. So start with the first thing, you have the dependency graph, and if none of the inputs change, you're not even considering that node again. Then there is on disk, on your local machine, a cache that contains a hash of the action, that is a hash of all the inputs, and the command. 
and maps to the output. Um, if, if that output is still the, the latest result of that execution. So for each action, the latest execution is stored as a hash on disk together with the artifacts. So you compute the cache key. If that is there, then you don't uh, rerun the action. That is standard local caching with just one invocation of Bazel. You can then also specify a remote cache, which may or may not be on the same machine, um, where you then store more such uh, hash of action and hash of output, uh, triple so if you change and then change file back and run built in between, you can keep that from cache, and then it's your responsibility to get some uh, cache rotation to throw out all things. And that can also be on a remote side, typically also combined with a remote execution service, so that you then just send it there, hopefully have a cache hit. Um, yeah, so there's that protocol as well. So yeah, these are the main levels of caching. So the, the question was whether it's worth trying Bazel or Makefile is okay if you have a very small project. Um, so let's say if you have a small project and have your build, uh, have a Makefile already that works, then and you're happy with that, then you don't have to change. I personally use Bazel also for kind of new private projects, and I'm quite happy with it. I mean, it is a big tool, but it doesn't mean that it can't build small projects either. I mean, you have to accept that Bazel is written mainly in Java, so you have to have Java on each machine where you want to run Bazel. So you have that as a runtime dependency, but for me personally, it's fine to have Java installed on my desktop and work with that. And I think it's definitely worth for small projects, at least for some where you don't have all your infrastructure in place already, because of that declarative approach that makes it much easier to write build files and make sure they're correct. And you can change the way you build things later at a single point where you maintain all your rules. So I like that flexibility even for small projects. But in the end, if you have something which you're happy with, then use it. But if not, and if you can accept Java as a runtime dependency of your build system, then I think it's definitely worth trying Bazel also for small projects. Okay, the question was about resource usage compared to make. Um, since you keep the full dependency graph in memory, you need a bit more memory. Also, you have a bit of overhead just to start up a JVM, et cetera. But with nowadays desktop, that is not a problem, but it's, it's more. Um, since you want to not recompute the dependency graph, you have that process in background, which you don't have to make. After an invocation, no process survives. Um, it is more, but it's, it's not terribly more. I mean, it's about the effort of starting up a JVM, keeping that persistent, and then it depends on the size of your project. Of course, if you want to have a huge dependency graph in memory, then that is resource usage, which you don't have with make, but the make, then you pay the price of re-reading all the make files again once you're at the next invocation. So, basically treating time for memory. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Yes, that's it. Thank you for your attention.